comes out of Seward, Nebraska, Concordia College in Seward, Nebraska, the best of all the Concordias in our Missouri Senate system. I know sometimes she'll throw up that place up there in Wisconsin, but that's, that's a typo. It's Concordia Seward. Where, where is it located again? Concordia Seward, Nebraska. That's right. Then and now. Then and now. I found it very appropriate. This past week, I was actually doing a little bit of cleaning, a little bit of organizing, not in my office but at home. I was digging through a box and lo and behold, what do I find but a number of my grandfather's sermons. My grandfather, Lutheran pastor for 61 years. He came to the great state of Florida as the first Missouri Synod Lutheran pastor in the entire state. Came here in 1894 right out of the seminary and he continued to preach for the next 61 years years. A devout man of God. A faithful man of God. And here's the problem. I inherited an entire box, cardboard box, of his sermons. Wouldn't that be great? I don't have to write a sermon. I'll just use grandpa's old sermons. I got 61 years worth of sermons. Problem! He had his own version of shorthand and you can't read them. You can kind of go through and pick out a little piece here, a little piece there. You can reference the Bible verses because he wrote out, you know, 2 Timothy 2.10. But you can't really read the sermons except, I was looking through all of these, and he wrote them on scrap pieces of paper and, you know, back of envelopes, and these are all tied together and rubber band together, etc., etc. And I found one that he had written out longhand. I don't know why he did it, but he did. Maybe he wrote it with me in mind some, what, nine decades later? And I was reading through that sermon, I thought, you know what? This is a great message. This is a message that the people of God need to hear, not only back in that day, but even today. That's a picture of it. That's my grandfather. That's my grandfather at Zion Lutheran Church in beautiful Gotha, Florida, the oldest Missouri Synod Lutheran Church in the state of Florida. That's where he preached for 61 years. Let's look at the next slide. There he is in the pulpit. It's not a good picture, but you get an idea. And that's the church on the outside. That's what it looks like even to this day. If you go to Gotha, look at the corner of Hempel Avenue and Gotha Road, that's the church he preached at, faithfully all those years. What did he say? The text is Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. It's Pentecost. The Bible says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire, it separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say that again. All of them were filled with what? The Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in tongues. Now, does that mean they started babbling? You ever been to a Pentecostal revival? I have. Yeah, I have. They began to speak in foreign languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each of them heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, How is this? Aren't all these men Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Pergia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the other parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome. They were speaking Latin, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? 
you know what that means. They had all been to confirmation, right? Yeah, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them. They have had too much wine. And so my grandfather's sermon begins. The outpouring of the Holy Ghost on that first Pentecost Sunday had two effects. First, there were miracles. The apostles could speak in a variety of languages. Notice what our text says. Aren't all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them speak in our own native language? The second gift is courage. Following the crucifixion of Jesus, the apostles hid in fear that they too would suffer the same agony and crucifixion and death. And yet, following the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, these men are bold to proclaim the resurrected Jesus. The Jesus risen from the grave. That Jesus is, in fact, the one promised by God to come and to be Savior. There are those who say today, we need another Pentecost. I would rather say we are indeed having it. If only we would open our eyes and see it. Since the days of the first Pentecost, a continuous Pentecost is happening to the end of days. The same spirit is active. The same means to save men from sin are still employed by the Holy Ghost. The same results are being registered. We just saw the film. He didn't write this. I'm throwing this in. We just saw the film to where we have individuals who are bold going to communist countries where it is illegal to proclaim the grace and mercy of God, to in fact proclaim that there is a God will land you in prison. And yet men and women are still made bold by the Holy Spirit. Like the disciples, they say, we can't help but speak of the things that we have seen and heard. My grandfather's sermon continues. The day of Pentecost is a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy found in Joel chapter 3 and by our own Lord's promise in John chapter 15. All of them, all the followers of Jesus Christ, received the same spirit that day. Have you ever thought about that? Because we concentrate on who? The 11. Remember Judas? He went out and hung himself. So there's 11 apostles left. Matthias has not been chosen yet. So these 11 bold and brave men who have received the power of the Holy Spirit, they go, they proclaim the word of God. People hear it in their own language. They come to faith. They acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior. They too now have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that you and I have, the same Spirit that was born in us through the waters of holy baptism, the same Spirit that is nurtured and nourished each and every day by prayer and the reading of God's Word, the same Spirit that is strengthened when we approach the altar of God to receive the body and blood of Christ. I need to stick to the script. My grandfather would say that I am too long in the pulpit. He was a short preacher. There is no promise that there will be a repetition of that first Pentecost, nor should we deem it essential. In other words, we're not going to hear the rushing of wind. We're not going to see the tongue of fire. What is essential is faith. Faith is more important than speaking in tongues or extraordinary gifts. Have you ever wished you had a gift from God like that? The gift of healing? Okay, that you could just lay hands on somebody, boom, you're healed. You have perfect health. And yet according to what my grandfather is saying, as wonderful as that might be, faith is key. Faith is necessary. Faith is essential. The same spirit that worked on Pentecost Sunday is the same spirit that works among us today. He enlightens us to know Jesus and adorns our lives with the fruits of the spirit as recorded in Galatians chapter 5. How many of you remember the gifts of the spirit, the fruits of the spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Okay, read Galatians chapter 5 today. 
That same powerful spirit works through the means of grace in both word and sacrament. We have the word. Preach the word. Preach the word. That's what my grandfather said 90 years ago. Preach the word. You don't know what to say to somebody. Share the message of Christ. You're afraid of being backed into a corner, argued into a corner. Yeah, maybe I don't want to be embarrassed or humiliated. I don't want to be made to look stupid. Preach the word. Preach the word. Do you know what Jesus said in his very first sermon? Matthew chapter 4 verse 17. Repent. For the kingdom of God is near. That's a sermon that you can use in your own life. Get to know God. Get to know God. Get to know Christ as your Savior. Preach the word. If you preach the word, you will have Pentecost. When human pulpits prefer human wisdom, when preachers preach to satisfy itching ears, I found it ironic that our epistle lesson for today quotes that very same verse. When people do what? They want to hear what they want to hear, not the pure word of God, not the pure word of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We see churches across the nation and across the world that are preaching to the itching ears of individuals. My grandfather said 90 years ago, I say it again today, that is no good. Whenever preachers preach for human wisdom and itching ears, then no Pentecost is to be expected. But we are not ashamed of the gospel. As the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Even if only two or three are gathered together in a humble home where the word is shared, Christ is present. And the Holy Ghost is working for, for, for conversion, forgiveness, and spiritual strength. We get impressed by numbers, don't we? Yeah, you know, wow, well, look at this church. It's got 5,000, 7,000, 8,000, 10,000 members. The numbers that Christ talks about, think about this. How many people were with him when he talked to the woman at the well? One, the woman at the well. Yeah. How many people did he talk to when he met Zacchaeus? One, Zacchaeus. We get so caught up in the big numbers. Remember the two or three. When you sit down at your kitchen table, when you're on your back porch having coffee with a friend, Christ is present when you preach the word. So what is really needed is not a repeat of miracles but rather an appreciation and use of what God has given us in his word. Share the word, and the Holy Spirit will do his work. And do not be surprised or shocked if there are some who reject the word. Do not be surprised or shocked or disappointed if some resist the power of the Holy Ghost. It happened that first Pentecost. There were those who mocked the apostles and rejected the message of salvation. They openly scoffed at them, saying that they were drunk on new wine. Thus we see the Holy Ghost resisted and rejected then, and we will see it again today. But remember the parable of the sower. The good seed and the good soil that produces a bumper crop. So it is with the believer who shares his faith. He does so boldly, confidently knowing that the Holy Ghost will work through his word. Those who preached that day saw 3,000 people added to the number of those who believed. This continues to happen every day when believers share the word. 
As the Bible says, so shall my word be that goeth out of my mouth. It will not return to me void, but will accomplish that for which I have sent it. May we never depart from the word of God, not one iota. May we never be unfaithful to the word of God. Rather, let us always be faithful to God, for he is faithful to us. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in the one true faith, which is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.